Welcome to the Exam Room Podcast brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Hello, I'm the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thank you so very much for watching and downloading in more than 150 countries around the world and making the Exam Room one of the most consumed nutrition podcasts anywhere on the planet today. And today we are going to take another look at olive oil and even closer look. Recently had the opportunity to discuss this really fascinating research, pitting a healthy diet with and without olive oil head to head in terms of biomarkers, Dr. Neil Barnard and I had the opportunity to do that. But now today, we actually have the lead researcher of that study with us, Dr. Monica Agarwal. Thank you so very much for returning to the show. Oh, it's great to be here. It's been us some time, so it's neat to see all your improved you know, gadgets, et cetera. <laughs> I know. Haven't we gone high tech? I mean, You're, look at the banner. Bet. I mean, I this, is, we yeah, this, is, this is the big time. <laughs> it's not a podcast anymore. This is a production, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I'm thrilled to be using all of our new toys with you because this study that you did has really been making the headlines. Were you surprised before we get into the results? Were you surprised at how many people were like, wow, this is interesting stuff? Well, certainly I think that the data is provocative. And so we anticipated when we saw the results that, oh boy, um, we're gonna be making some waves here. So it was surprising, and, and but also a lot, you know, um, you want to make impact. And so it was nice to see that we were able to do a quality study that warrants, it certainly brings up questions about the way we've been pushing oils as a society. All right, so we, really in this study are looking at a healthy whole food plant-based diet with and without olive oil. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. How, how exact, that's the really simple explanation. Yeah, I was going to say, it. I was like, oh break yeah. It, break it down yeah. further for us. How did you set this up? Yeah. So, you know, I think that people, so the Mediterranean diet is super popular and the Mediterranean diet uh, is a plant-based diet with other components, right? And it has all a, a significant amount and abundance, what we call of extra virgin olive oil. There's some lean proteins, fish primarily, a little bit of dairy, but not much. And so there's so many studies that have come out in the last 10 to 15 years that have said that the Mediterranean diet is an optimal diet. And so in most of the guidelines, there's some component of this Mediterranean diet. So to be fair, so there's also guidelines to suggest that whole food plant-based diet, DASH diet, these are all diets that are sort of the optimal diets for heart disease. But there's a lot of differences, aren't there, in these diets. There's a difference in the fat content, there's a difference in the components. And so I've always wondered, and I had always wondered why, um, you know, what part of a Mediterranean diet and what part of a whole food plant-based diet was actually beneficial. And we have some of the data from the old New England Journal PREDIMED study, which showed that people who even ate a Mediterranean style diet, the people who are most plant-based of those people, they actually did the best. So that was also, that was a piece of data that we had that was compelling. And we also had one piece of data that showed from that same study that people who were on the Mediterranean diet with extra virgin olive oil really had no difference in LDL, which is that bad cholesterol that we're always thinking about with heart disease. And there was no difference between that with or within the Mediterranean diet versus the standard diet. But that's really all we had. And so we didn't really know for sure that olive oil, like I've always wondered, is olive oil actually a good thing? Should we be eating olive oil for our health? Should we be eating oil for our health. And I don't think that that has never been a answered fully. So you set out to answer that <laughs> question. I mean, that's, it's again, I mean, like that is awfully ambitious because in order to arrive at a definitive answer, I mean, there are certain parameters that you need to operate within on these studies to make sure, yeah, this data is really locked tight. Yes. And you did that. So how did you make sure to put up those guards to make sure that the answer that you arrived at was, in fact, a, a good one and one that we could rely upon? Yes, it's a good question. I actually think nutrition studies are the hardest studies to run and to write. And I remember when I was writing this design, I kept changing it and talking to people and say, what do you think? Should I do? Should I do? Because it is so hard to run a study like this. So with that in mind, nutrition studies have many flaws every single time. We have to often rely on recall. We have to take the word for it from the patient or the participant. And so there's always these nuances and um, that you have to consider. So a couple things that I thought about. So in order for me to, I wanted to look at patients who had 
risk for heart disease. So I took patients who were borderline to high risk for heart disease, but not secondary prevention. So I didn't want to look, I needed to sort of narrow the, the playing field a little bit. So I decided to remove secondary prevention, meaning people who already have heart disease from the study. Because really, if you show the data in primary, it's going to likely be positive also in a secondary prevention study. Oh, not always, but likely. So then I started saying, okay, well, how do I, how can I make a diet that's, you know, a Mediterranean and plant-based diet to me are very similar except for these uh, little nuances. So what I did was I said, okay, let's take everybody, they must be on a standard diet or a non-plant-based or a Mediterranean diet. And then let's switch them to the most extreme of diets, extreme quote unquote, in terms of fat content, most restricted, and then add in the piece that I wanted to adjust. And so that's how I decided to kind of make the dietary uh, how I designed the study. So in other words, you go from a standard diet and then I had 20 people go into a whole food plant-based diet with high olive oil, which was four tablespoons of oil per day. Um, and then I had 20 people do um, the whole food plant-based diet with less than a teaspoon of oil per day. Um, and then we use them and we had them go through that for four weeks. And then we did something that has many negatives and positives, which we then cross them over, which means we actually took the people who, so everybody can be their own control. So mm -hmm. that's the beauty of that because, right, there's so many between, there's so many within, between people differences. And so if you try to compare patient X to patient Y, you're like, you can't win. So so many studies like this are designed as crossover studies. So we designed it as a crossover where we did four weeks at high olive oil and then we washed it out and then we did four weeks of low olive oil. And similarly, the people who started low then washed out and moved to high. So that was the best way we could come up with to kind of isolate the one component we really wanted to look at. Now, it was imperfect. You know, we had a lot of what we call, um, we had crossover effect because we, we, didn't wash out long enough, you know, despite talking to people all over the country about what's the long, the right amount of washout between diets, it was still not long enough. So our second part of our study is definitely not as exact or as worthwhile or as qual high quality as the first part. That doesn't ignore the fact that the first part is pretty darn amazing, which shows that when you move people from a standard diet and you put them on a high olive oil or a low olive oil diet, the LDL reduction with a high olive oil, both of them are good, first of all. But with a high olive oil diet, so that greater than four tablespoons of olive oil per day, there is a less reduction in your LDL than people who are on a low olive oil. So when we, when we were able to see that people who were on a low olive oil diet had almost a 25 point drop in their LDL, whereas people who are on the high olive oil drop only dropped about 15 points. And that's a significant amount because remember from the cholesterol trialist study, and you know, I'm getting a lot of science, I'm getting sciencey on you here. Nerd out with Chuck. us, nerd us. Uh, <laughs> but for every 39 point drop in LDL, you can improve mortality by 22%. Wow. And so for, it's very important to sort of, so L, a lot of us use LDL in studies because it's a surrogate endpoint for outcomes. All right. So that's that's all really interesting. Do we know what it is specifically about the olive oil that, you know, even though, yeah, there's benefit, you saw that drop, like what is it that inhibits that further drop that we saw in the diet sans olive oil? Is it inflammation? Is it just the fact that maybe that group wasn't losing as much weight? What do we think that that causes. Yeah, so there was a difference in the weight, and that is a statistical issue that we did notice is that there was a slight difference in weight between the low olive oil and the high olive oil group. Um, there was also a difference in fat intake, and this is what we think was the most important part, is the people who ate the high olive oil diet were ate almost about a 48% fat intake, whereas the low olive oil ate about 32%. Neither of them were low fat, just so we're clear, because but they, there was a difference in the diet in terms of the fat amount. What we think is happening is that in low olive oil, right, there's low saturated fat um, and lower saturated fat than in high olive oil, right? It's like 1.9 grams, uh, milligrams of, um, of saturated fat, or sorry, grams of saturated fat per uh, uh, teaspoon of olive oil. Um, so for 
And so when you eat less olive oil, there's going to be less saturated fat. Plus olive oil, um, when you, in the people who were in the low olive oil group, they were still getting a lot of fat, but from whole foods, right? And so we really emphasize eating avocado and other unrefined sources of whole foods that had some uh, saturated fat in them, but have loads of fiber and other nutrients in them. And we think that's the reason that they had more impact in their um, in their numbers. So nuts, seeds, maybe coconut would have been on those diets? We didn't specifically recommend coconut, um, but I can't recall if anybody in particular was eating an excess amount of coconut, um, but it was avocados, it was nuts and seeds, uh, and they were liberal amounts. So we had no restriction on the amount of food people to ate. We told people to eat until they felt full. Um, and we wanted people to, and for sure, interestingly, the, the low olive oil group, and maybe no surprise, they actually ate a higher carb intake mm. um, because they had less olive oil. So they compensated by having almost 50% of their diet was carbohydrates. Did you spell out the menu specifically for the participants or did you basically say, here are the you know options that you have, make whatever you want kind of from this list? Yeah, so we tried to make it very much every group was a co every cohort went through an eight week cooking class really a nine week cooking class technically because of the washout um, where we taught people how to cook how to use the foods that they ate but we didn't tell them what to eat um, we just told them how to you know get their olive oil in for the people and that was interestingly a struggle for a lot of people mm. especially when they moved from low to high olive oil that was a struggle um, because people didn't want to all of a sudden eat uh, or drink uh, that olive oil. So that was a struggle. We def definitely struggled with components like that, but we did not tell them what they had to eat. But it was really cute. I mean, probably one of the best parts of the study for me was that the patients, so the participants loved the cooking classes and wow. they became such a community. And, you know, a lot of them were participants, they were all recruited from the University of Florida. And when we, um, you know, some of the people, they'd know why they were from different ethnic class backgrounds, different uh, financial levels. I mean, they became this community of people that uh, by the end they were asking, they were sharing each other's numbers. They wanted to still continue to discuss things. And, and they would come on the show and say, or come on to the class and it was interactive and say, you know, what do I do? I picked this up from the grocery store. What do I do with this? And that's such a special thing because then the whole group is there, the, the chef, culinary chef, a dietitian is there and saying, hey, this is what I would do. And then other people are piping in. And that was a beautiful part of the program, actually. And, and you know, I would think that that like speaks to long-term lifestyle changes as well. If you have that enthusiasm and sense of community, you put those two things together, yes. somebody I would think would be much more inclined to stick with Yes, you and so, you know, if, if I had more funding, I would love to have done like a one-year kind of data assessment because I think long-term adherence is the next big question, which is, you know, how do we get people to be adherent long term and are they adherent? And so one of the program I do, I love to do adherence studies. And so I'm actually running two studies right now where I'm looking at adherence, where I incorporated uh, nutrition education and culinary, I've, you know, sort of nuanced culinary programming and providing people with food. And then I sort of gradually remove the food, but keep the hoping that the impact was in the education component plus the food, but then you pull away the food. Are people able to still stay adherent in the long term? And I think that's where we're going sort of uh, next in terms of my studies. Oh, that'd be great. I would love to see that. Um, specific to this study, did you limit sodium intake at all? Were there any sort of barriers there? We advise low sodium. Okay. Okay. Um, and I guess, how does olive oil compare to other types of oil out there? Because it has been billed for years as a healthier oil. And you could say, well, healthier compared to what? Coconut oil, palm oil, vegetable oil, things like that. Why has olive oil until now been viewed as the healthier option or just healthy, period? Yeah, I mean, for many reasons. Um, it's overall pretty high in mono and polyunsaturated fats. Uh, it's high in polyphenol content, and um, which is, I think, primarily the big reasons. Like you bring it up compared to coconut oil, for instance. Coconut oil is primarily a saturated fat. Now it is a medium chain, but it is a saturated fat. So it's one of the, one of the oils that we are, as a society, are not in support of. 
I think olive oil was lumped into a Mediterranean diet. And when we saw the changes in the Mediterranean, excuse me, when we saw the changes in the, um, in the diet, in the PREDIMED study and, and in the, in the older Mediterranean studies, we just assumed that it was a, it was everything. It's kind of like the old alcohol studies where, where we were like, oh, well, people in the Mediterranean diet, they drink a lot of red wine, so red wine must be good for you. And hold on, hold the phone. Is that really true <laughs> that red wine is really good for you? Or is it just better than what we were giving them before? And I think that this is why study is important, right? Because we were able to say, well, yes, it's better. There's no question that both the extra, um, the whole food plant-based diets with high and low olive oil, both were better than the alternative, which was the standard diet, standard American diet. But that didn't mean necessarily that every part of the diet was was beneficial. And I think that's what's key is that you got to take out those pieces and you got to say, well, is this the piece that's important? Because that's where we're at now. I mean, in our studies, I think is that we already know the Dietary Guidelines of America, the American College of Cardiology, the American Heart Association, we all know that plant forward eating is optimal eating. Well, that's that is way better than any standard American diet. But then there are nuances that we need to now start separating out and saying what what parts of it are really actually worthwhile. I think it's very safe to say we should be eating loads and loads of plants. They're high in fiber, um, lots of phytonutrients, nuts and seeds, healthy fats. I mean, these are things that we should be doing. And then I think taking away I like what people to take away from this is that yes, we need more study. Yes, it wasn't a perfect study. Yes, the crossover design had some issues, but it should give people pause before they just start adding olive oil into the diet or any oil into their diets because it's gonna make their health better. All right, yes, it's better than the alternative, but you shouldn't necessarily be eating olive oil or any oils for your health. I think a lot of people and, and even you know food systems ar ar around the world have kind of the traffic light system green, yellow, red, olive oil would fall into which of the three? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I certainly wouldn't put it in the green, okay. I guess is how I would say it. Um, whether I would put it in the red or in the yellow, I think is debatable, right? Because there is some data on people who are lower in fat and who have lower caloric intake that they actually don't do badly and actually do better in terms of blood pressure, et cetera, when they have a little bit of the fats uh, in the oil. So I think that you definitely are not going to I think that we should take away not to put it in the green. And there are many people that are drinking and eating olive oil for their health. And I think that we should walk away from that concept until we have further study. Drinking it. I, I just, I can't imagine that it has a great flavor just straight as no, a chaser. Yeah, I've tried, I've, you should try it. It's, oh, it, it has a very interesting, and then, but the more polyphenols, it's more and more bitter. And um, people who eat in the Mediterranean area, it's sitting on everybody's table. You know, it's very commonly eaten. Um, what we do as Americans is we put it on our salads, right? right? We put it in and we're like, oh, there's a salad. I'm gonna put in like, you're just like pouring in and you're you know, looking away and you're you know, pouring olive oil on your salad and then a little bit of balsamic vinegar too. And right. pe you know, do you need that oil? I mean, I all want people to step back and think and say, hold on a second, that oil isn't necessarily good for you. Why don't you just have that really great salad with a little balsamic vinegar? Right, but then you, you look at these regions, maybe a blue zone where they do incorporate more olive oil than, you know, um, than you would expect in terms of longevity. But, you know, is it safe to say that they're living longer, not because of the olive oil. There are probably some other lifestyle and dietary right. factors in there, and it's not the olive oil that's keeping them around to become a centenarian. Right. I want us to be careful to remember that this was a 40 person study and needs further study. And because I don't want us to walk away and say that we should change everything based on 40 people. But I think that we should also appreciate that, yeah, that it's not necessarily good for you. And that the people that are eating in these blue zone areas, I mean, they're walking, they have icky guy, I mean, they sleep, they're, folk, they're, you know, they're walking to the market every day. You know, I remember being in Tuscany last year and, you know, the number of seniors that I saw walking up and down these hills, I mean, there, there's just so many more comp components to longevity than we appreciate. And um, I, 
I actually am not a huge fan of people focusing on one component only because I think that there are many people that feel, really work on just their diet, yeah. but these other pieces aren't there and they don't feel better, right? Yeah. Or they only get a little bit better and they can't understand why they're not completely better. And it's important to understand that it takes what many more things to make a person do well and be healthy than just changing this one thing. And there's no magic bullet and there's no magic pill. And so I think that that's really important to remember is that olive oil was never gonna be a magic pill. If I added it to my diet, I was gonna be better, live longer. And so similarly, there's so many things that we need to do. And that's what makes the whole thing hard, right? Who has time to exercise well, be low stress and move, sleep well, you know, we're doing the best we can, so. Admission, I mean, like I work in this space full time and I still find it hard to do all of those things every single day. Yeah. And so if you are beating yourself up because you haven't fit all of that into your day, well, guess what? You're human. Yeah. So it's tough. Yeah, I'd like people to take that away from this because I think so many people who listen to me and reach out to me are looking for this one thing that they should do to fix, or they know my rheumatoid arthritis story and they think, well, how did you do it? Because I want to copy exactly what you did. You know, I, I think it's imperfect. You know, I think that there's so many things to make a person heal and get better and just you know, keep trying as many things as you can, try to sleep more, try to move more, try to eat well, and just don't necessarily eat olive oil for your health. And you're speaking to that from experience. The first interview we did together was all about your amazing transformation and your horrible battle with rheumatoid arthritis, which you were able to just come out the other side and, and just thrive. I'm sure that journey was way more than one thing for you as well, wasn't it? Well, it, de it definitely was. and. It that's a whole nother story it for sure. Yeah. Um, but yes, it, it was a lot of different things that I had to fix about myself to make myself better. And sometimes those are the, those moments when you fall the hardest are the ones that, you know, you, uh, you work your, you got to work like crazy to get out of those holes that you get into, but boy, does it make it sweeter when you get out? Absolutely. Makes you appreciate things. Final question for yeah. you. Uh, if you had unlimited funding, what would be the next study that you do? You know, it's so funny because somebody emailed me recently and said, what's your next study? Uh, tell me, uh, I, I'm, I've got the funds for you. And I was like, oh, my God, I had a little giddy moment. Like, I was like, oh, my God, oh, my God, which one do I want to run? You know, I, I think um, I would love to run this study a bigger and better. Uh, I'd love to do a, do it again, wash out, sort of improve the number, like increase the numbers, a longer wash out. Uh, I would probably focus on um, making sure that the fat content was the same in both of the groups, which I did not do. Uh, and that's something that we have received criticism for appropriately. So uh, it's just, it's hard. Uh, to do that in a anybody who's run a nutrition study knows that. Um, but that's those are the things I would kind of think about doing um, for my next study. How much just hypothesizing here? I'm not sure that there's even a way to precisely answer this. But how much do you think that having uneven amounts of fat in the two groups affected the outcome here? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. So to me, a lot of I think critics would definitely say that, well, in the lower olive oil group, you didn't you didn't have enough fat in your intake to make them equal. And that's going to always going to be a criticism and 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 inappropriate that we have to consider. And so in order you for you to really have run this like almost like a perfect study, you really want them to eat the exact same amount of fat. But I think and my counter to that is, is both of them were not, were moderate fat diets. And so even the people who are on the low olive oil diet, they still got 30 some percent of their diet um, was fat. And so I think that it's important to realize that we didn't give them like a low fat diet restriction with the extra virgin olive oil diet. Um, so uh, I think, um, I think that it's it's always tricky when it when you don't control because that becomes a source of criticism. But like I said, my my counter to that is is that they were both high, kind of higher fat diets, and we were still able to show impact. And I think it just makes us think that all these other foods, like don't eat the oils, eat the avocado, like yeah. just eat, eat the whole food, the unrefined right. food. Right, and right. I think that that's the difference that we were able to create and show. What was the daily fat intake on average? 48% uh, in the extra virgin olive oil that was high, and I think it was 32% or so in the uh, low extra virgin olive oil. Right um, around 2,000 calories a day? Oh, um, you know, in terms of calories, I can't remember that we measured the amount of calories, or we didn't certainly report it. 
Uh, I'd have to check actually okay. what was the calorie intake because okay. it was unrestricted caloric intake. Right. Um, I bet I had that. I just don't recall it this minute. Yeah, I guess like my point is it's it wasn't like this was some low calorie 1200 a day. A thousand oh, no, calorie no, no, a day no, no, diet. no, 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 no. These were ample. these were moderate fat on unrestricted caloric intake uh, in the 50 percent carbohydrates in the low extra virgin olive oil gotcha. group. I mean, these were um, these were regular diet people were eating regular foods, regular whole food, plant based foods. All right. Well, hopefully one day you get the unlimited funding. And, uh, we, we can do that. Do that <laughs> yeah. Full, full study yeah. Full. yeah, I do love to run studies. I, yeah. They're super hard uh, and they definitely take time. And, and we did do this study over covid, which was a challenge. Wow. Uh, recruitment was a challenge. There was a lot of fear to come in to get your labs and get your blood work. And so it was definitely a challenge, um, but definitely well worth it. All right. Well, greatly appreciate you being here to share your insight. Congratulations on provocative data. Doc. Thank you. Thank you. Provocative data. <laughs>